by which we will gradually be prepared, if you will, cooked and offered, um, <clears throat> and um, to take advantage of that, sometimes um, we have to exercise, uh, exert some effort. Uh, sometimes I'm asked, I have been a few times in the past, what to do if you live in some place where there's no sadhusanga. I think some of you know the answer. It's move. <laughs> so at least enough movement sometime during the year to take advantage of, of, of uh, company of serious uh, persons, persons seriously interested in their in spiritual progress and, and beyond that, in the dispensation of lower and Nityananda, which is uh, very special amongst spiritual possibilities, opportunities that are available in the world. This one is uh, quite unique, and I'm sure we'll discuss that to some extent, it's worth some length, in the course of our uh, gathering here, as we do regularly, wherever we go, wherever we gather. <clears throat> I think that uh, tonight I have been asked to ask you all if there's any questions. And, uh, and then tomorrow it is the Baldi Porni, Shibaram Jai. And so we'll discuss about um, the significance of Maldiv <clears throat> within Gaudiya Vaishnavism and, and, and um, Ashram Maharaj was speaking in the evening uh, about uh, Maldiv and all some others. Maharaj was a chair there for you behind you. So, are there any questions tonight? Yes. Um, I've been trying to understand a little more deeply the um, concept of Sadhaka Deya. And um, I think one of the things I've heard you discuss before about it um, being given at the time of initiation. Um, but we also know a lot of previous lives and, and that kind of thing that you know, it's quite rare to like, reach perfection. Um, after being initiated, so obviously there's a time when someone might have been initiated, so I'm trying to get my head around um, that concept, like is when someone receives a, a sadhaka deha, mm -hmm. but they don't complete in that lifetime, mm -hmm. how does that relate as they do mm -hmm. continue their path? Yeah, well, initiation, of course, is an English word that uh, implies a beginning, the Sanskrit word is diksha, and uh, it uh, conveys the idea of the transmission of uh, Dubyagan, divine knowledge, and then in the form of the mantra, this uh, diksha, initiation, comes under the uh, heading, if you will, of Sambandagyan. And, um, Krishna's Kavira Swaswami has referred to the, the guru who imparts the mantra as the rupa of Krishna and the guru who gives instruction, Siksha, who may be the, the same guru, should be, um, although there may be more than one, to the uh, swarup of Krishna. The main point in his uh, statement really is that the two are equally um, representative of the uh, of Bhagavan, Rajendra Nanda, Sri Krishna in our case, in our lineage, <clears throat> and should be equally regarded, but their function is different. So, for example, Perhaps in brief, he wants to convey that as, as well by invoking the, the, the words rupa and swarupa. Rupa means form in this case. 
and the form of uh, Krishna is present in, in the mantra. Mm -hmm. We were talking the other night uh, about sound. We had a, a meeting, a gathering, and um, we explained in brief that all sounds are not the same. And uh, so the, the origin of the sounds, for example, that make up the Veda um, well, uh, is said to be not uh, human in origin. They're, they're said not to be human in origin, which means they're divine, which means that they have no origin. Um, but they are discovered, nonetheless, by rishis, who then, um, in the Kali Yuga, it's thought that they, they, they write them down. Hmm? And uh, sometimes uh, those Upanishads, sounds, Upanishad means to sit, sit close. The implication is that I could, I'm going to tell you something that's not for the general public, come close and let me whisper in your ear, it's an old song. But, um, <clears throat> And say the words you long to hear. Um, <laughs> I'm in love with you. That's what it says. How the song goes, um, and it, it's appropriate actually coming to my mind as we think of this transmission, right? That is uh, diksha or the conveyance of transcendental sound um, discovered within, or this pursuit within. Uh, the sounds are heard. Hmm? They're heard on the level of we call pasha. They're they're para, but they're heard or intuited. I guess we could say, as much as in Vaishnavism, it's said that we see by by hearing. So there is para transcendental sound, and it is intuited uh, pashanti. Another the level of sound that corresponds with. Uh, a booty, an intuitive kind of knowing. And then there's madhyama, sound that is the, is the, the form of, uh, of thoughts. This is information, sound as, as information. And then baikari, the actual uh, naming. So only one of these. Uh, interestingly enough, of uh, forms of sound uh, involves uh, difference. And that we have, for example, in Baikara, we have Polish language, we have English language, Italian language, Spanish language, Bengali language, and so on and so forth. But the thoughts that those sounds by which we name and distinguish and determine, categorize and make sense, so to speak, out of the waking experience of the world. This is a chair, this is a microphone, this is a house. So, um, well, that is in different language. The thoughts that they are connected with, they're all the same. <laughs> the thoughts are all the same. So. Um, the implication is also as, as the sound becomes more refined in our experience as to the, the nature of sound, transcendental sound, then there's, there's, there's a unity. And as it breaks down, so to speak, there's a divergence, disparity, uh, uh, a difference, an undesirable difference in this case. Of course, we have a, a, we have a difference within within um, unity um, on the higher end, but on the lower end, the difference is the problem. But it's a made-up difference. It's a manufactured difference. The difference that arises from sense perception and so on and so forth, and, and the identities of Polish and English and German and whatnot. 
different languages, and so on. So, at any rate, to Pashanti, intuitive sound. So the Rishi is to experience the para, the transcendental reality that uh, uh, is a, has a sound. In Gita, Krishna has identified himself with the sound of oh, ahu. Ma, Emmy, meant with language, I guess. But uh, it, it, in one sense, these three letters individually relate to or uh, uh, refer to bur, bula, swa. But together, the three are something different than they are individually. Together as Om, they are all, con they have three are contained within something beyond them. And that is the sound of God. Of course, as I said the other night, Prabhupada once said, I don't know if I can say it like him, but he said, you cannot get as much bliss from saying Om as you can from saying Krishna. It's time we, we fill up with bliss to say that. Um, so, dure harikatamita, shortam api upanishadam, dure harikatamita. Jiva Goswami's statement of Bhakti Siddhartha. The sounds of the Upanishads, they leave one dure very far from where one can arrive by harikata. Dure harikatamita, kampashu pulakadayava. By the sounds of the Upanishad, we can become peaceful. Neti, neti. Not this, not that. Not this, not that. <laughs> what is, we need some commentary. If you're very thoughtful, like the Rishis, hearing the sound, they intuited. it. They intuited it, they had an intuitive sensibility, and they heard the sound, and they understood it. Neti, neti. In one sense, it means not this, not that. So we ourselves identify with this and with that. You've probably heard me say this before, but this and that. I'm, in other words, I think that I am this or I am that. I am. Uh, but all the whatever is this or that that I refer to and identify myself with is uh, here today and, and, and gone tomorrow. Hmm? I think I'm this, I think I'm that, I think I'm Polish, I think I'm American, I think I'm young, I think I'm old, I think I'm uh, of a particular gender, hmm? whatever may be the case. In all of the this and the that, which is changing, coming and going, that doesn't endure, there's something in the very expression, I am this and I am that, that endures. What is that? If I say I am this and I am that, if we take the this and the that to be something that doesn't endure, what's left? I am, that's left. And I am is a much deeper a conception of self than I am this or I am that. Mm -hmm. whether it be a thing or even a thought. To think I am this or I am that mm -hmm. is to not uh, utilize the mind to, the, to our advantage. As the Gita says, the mind is, uh, has, can work to our advantage or can work to our disadvantage. It's the center around which the senses are function. If the mind is not connected with the sense, it's connected with the sense object, the experience of the object will be limited if experienced at all. Just as a thought, as an aside, bhakti as a yoga all of yoga, of course, is about controlling the mind and the senses. Bhakti as a yoga is like the mind is. 
in relation to the senses. Because none of the yogas, jnana yoga, karma yoga, ashtanga yoga, can be effective without bhakti. And none of the senses can give the experience of the sense object unless the mind is connected with it. So, at any rate, the mind is the friend, Gita says, or the, the enemy. So yoga is for making, is taming the mind, making the friend, making it work uh, uh, for us, if you will. Mm. And uh, when it doesn't, then the thoughts are about things which are, as I say, here today and gone tomorrow, they're constantly coming and going, so this creates a disturbed condition for the mind. I thought about this, and from that thing that I thought about, for example, I thought I would gain security, but I can't keep it, so the very nature of the things, the appearances, coming and going. When the mind is preoccupied with them, then it becomes disturbed. So for it to be peaceful, it has to turn to an object that is enduring, not subject to change and transformation. So, of course, they all know this. These are just simple ideas for learned devotees like yourself. We turn the mind within and concentrate on I am, rather than I am this or I am that, we've gone a huge, a long uh, distance. But it's a very short distance at the same time in terms of the prospect of the self. Because I am not this or I am that, I am. But I am is not the full sense of of the Atma. And this, of course, where Gaudi Vaishnavism kind of picks up, Vaishnavism in general, but Gaudi Vaishnavism in particular, picks up where the schools of transcendental thought leave off. Because I am is true, but the, the nature of the self cannot be fully understood unless we assess its potential. Like take, for example, we have an ashram in Costa Rica. Some of you have been there, right? Adelan, Ijaya. The rest of you should come <laughs> and visit us. But Costa Rica is a, is a beautiful country. And one of the beautiful things about Costa Rica is that it has no army. And um, Central America is, can be a turbulent place with uh, revolutions and uh, uh, for years, in fact, the neighboring country, uh, Nicaragua, was uh, very turbulent and uh, uh, a lot of uh, military action there and so forth. And you would think that Costa Rica was in danger, but we have to look at Costa Rica in relation to its potential by association. And it was very much, in those days, associated with, and still is, I think to a large extent, with the United States, which you know, would make Nicaragua afraid with its military industrial complex, uh, comparatively, uh, power. So if we just look at Costa Rica, but we don't look at its potential, as a result of its extended um, association. We can't get the full picture. So it's a very strong country. Actually, it's the strongest uh, country in Central America and has no army. So we, as an Atma, we have a potential. We are, an, we are the object of love in this world. The Upanishads teach us, of course, that man does, the husband does not love his wife, wife does not love the husband. Husband and wife don't love the children. Children don't love the parents. 
what the, what the statement is saying, it sounds kind of bleak, but so I'm thinking like, what it's saying is everyone loves the self. Everyone loves the Atma. The Atma is the only thing that's lovable because matter is Asat, Bachit, Nirananda. Hmm? How do you love a stone, right? There's no love is, would be evaluated on a scale of recipro reciprocity. So, you know, if your husband and wife get together and the wife says, you never say you love me, you know, that, or you never listen to me. It's there's like, we're having a relationship. Huh? Wake up. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so, the reciprocal dealings, as much as that they're they're flowing, right? Then it's thought to be a loving, well, rapport. Right? Love, it requires action, movement. Karma is movement that in which there's no knowledge. Because it's movement in relation to things that don't endure in the pursuit of something that endures. <laughs> something that has no inherent happiness within it, or capacity to reciprocate, no love within it. Well, we're actually pursuing love. So in karma, there's no, there's no gyan. And in gyan, there's no karma. Because if you come to wisdom, that I'm not this or that, and it's the cause of suffering is attachment to things and thoughts about things, then you sit down, right? And you become a contemplative. There's no movement in Gyan and there's no knowledge in karma. But in love, in bhakti, there is movement and there is a kind of knowing. Love is pregnant with a kind of essential knowing. When you love, then you know what to do. So it's active. You do something and you know what to do. You know what you're doing. It's kind of an automatic knowing, an intuitive knowing. But as the Gita says, and is Raja Guhyam. Why is it Raja Guhyam? Raj means king. So Raj Vidya, Vidya means knowledge, the king of knowledge. And Krishna says this bhakti is also the Raja Vidya, Raja Guhyam king of secrets. It's, it's a great secret because the bhakti that he talks about, it's full of knowledge, but it looks like it's ignorance. We call it Gyan Shunya Bhakti. Those gopikas and gopas, what do they know? <laughs> they don't know these things we're talking about right now. The Upanishads, uh, or so it would appear. They don't know means they're not interested in those things. The Buddha came to, to give the message of Krishna to the, to, to the gopis. He thought he understood the message clearly. Don't lament. We are all moving into the work in the world according to the will of providence. What can be done? Things like this. He thought he understood the message. He said, Again, Bhakta. Of course, Krishna has a special liking for him to send him to Braj to get educated about the full face of Bhakti. So as he explained to the gopis, when they replied to him, he realized that he didn't understand the message at all. It was not, it sounded like one thing, it could be taken like that, but there were layers and layers of meaning within that. And through replying and discussing this message, Krishna's message with Buddha was the bearer, would have been In Braj, 
the scene only, it, it, the branch is depicted like this as being relatively uh, ignorant, village girls, uneducated. But we know, relative to your point, which I'm answering in a roundabout way, the question, when they come to this world in their sadhaka day, when Rupa Manjari comes here as Rupa Vasan, when Subal Saka comes here as uh, Pandit, what is his name? Gordas Pandit. We find this is a place where there's a need for knowledge, a little bit of knowledge. Rupa Goswami says, a little knowledge. Knowledge meaning, as I'm explaining, the difference between self and matter, between consciousness and the brain, for example. A little bit. It's not an anga of bhakti, but a little bit. And then there's, of course, knowledge of bhakti. That's another thing. Some again. They give this kind of knowledge. In other words, suddenly a, an uneducated village girl, when appearing in a sadhaka day, in a world where there's a need for knowledge, where there's real ignorance, we find that those gopis have so much knowledge. It's mind-boggling. Not therefore, Srinivas has written, Nana Shastri Vichara Naikinipano Sadharma Samastapako Lokanam Hitakarino Tegumane Munyavasharanyaka. Not only they do comprehensively the Shastra, but what what did they know? They, you have to use your head to soften your heart. They, they are a good example of that. They used their head and they wrote our bhakti shastras. Bhakti Rasamita Sindhu, Brihat Bhagavatananda, and so on. Ujjvam Nirmani, Lagu Bhagavatananda. Their commentaries and so on. I mean, it's extensive, their work. They're the, the kind of the architects, in a sense, of the Sambhattara, giving it, giving it a form, a structure, taking the waterfall of ecstasy that was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that they had, they had to stand back from in one sense, and making through their writing a lake out of that water, that it could be approached, and we could drink from it, take advantage of it, we could bathe in it. Hmm? So that world, the very dust, when Bhakti Siddhanta Sasri Thakur was told, in the West, they have questions we cannot answer. He said, oh, only a particle of dust from the lotus feet of Kork showed us, Babaji Maharaj, has enough knowledge to, to drown the whole world. Hmm. Dust from Braj, the Braj Raj is very famous. Chintamani. Hmm. These descriptions are there. So, in love, in bhakti, there's both movement, like karma, but different. In karma, there's obligatory movement. I, I've taken, so now I owe, so I have to go and work and repay and driven. Uh, I've hunted. And now I'm being hunted. So this is the movement of the world. And Gyan, then, if we have ingress of wisdom, then we can, we can cease from taking, cease from hunting, and we cease from being hunted. We can sit peacefully. Hmm? Right? There's no movement in Gyan, no knowledge in karma. But in bhakti, there's movement. It's a different kind of movement. Not a movement out of insufficiency, but out of fullness. So, as I often say, when you're full, and then you may need to dance. That's a difference. Then I'm hungry. I have to move and hunt. And I have to move because I've hunted. And I'm also being hunted. Jibo Jiva Sijimanam. Mother and sister, Darwinian perspective. One living being is food for another. There's another kind of movement in Leela, 
Peel and Carmen, they may look the same on the surface. But there's something very different. Neela is a movement on the, on the ground of which is knowing. It subsumes knowing. It, it, it over, it, 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 it's not unknowing, but the knowing is almost, well, it's the ground. It's not in the forefront. Because it would get in the way of peaceful interaction. Just like in the United States, it's a very powerful country. And so the military industrial complex is, is huge, but you don't, you don't see tanks being paraded on the streets or missiles being carried to, and showing it all off. You don't find machine gun guards at airports and things like that because it would get in the way of the peaceful commerce, right? If they get off the plane, you see the guy with the machine gun. <laughs> okay. Some countries may be required, but in the United States, all the military is hidden somewhere in a cave or somewhere or someplace out of sight. Right? So in Braj, the knowledge is all packed away. It's not necessary. Hmm? But if in America it should be attacked, then there will be missiles and planes everywhere. We have many of them. Hmm? And similarly, when, when there's need, if we're in an environment where, there's, where, where a gopi needs to exercise knowledge, like the material world, in the sadhaka day, then we find out oh, they have so much knowledge. We went there, we didn't see any planes. We thought, oh, this is easy. We'll take over. No missiles. We'll take over. And it, just before we, we just pick up the gun, and then all of a sudden uh, they're everywhere. Something like that. So don't think they have no knowledge in Braj. Yeah, we call it Gyanjan Bhakti. Bhakti unencumbered by Gyan. Because it, it gets in the way of the again, again, reciprocal dealings, love. But there is the world of Siddhadeya, and then there the world of Sadhakadeya, two worlds of Sadhakadeya. This world, what you're asking about, we will receive a Sadhakadeya from our Guru at the time of Diksha. And where else will we have a Sadhakadeya? In Sadhana Siddhubhumi. Where is that? Sadhana Siddhubhumi. The Bhumi, that land where Siddhas are engaged in Sadhana. Where is that? That is Gauranu Vila. Navadweep. Nadia. Gauda Mandala Bhumi. Gauda Mandala Bhumi. What is that? Chintamani. Gauda Mandala Bhumi. Gauda All the he, he, all these Gopikas, Gopas, and they're all in perfect Sadaka Dehas. They are Siddhas playing the Leela of Sadakas. And appropriately associating with and serving Krishna in the form in which he's appearing as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which is his Acharya Lila. Acharya means behavior. This is, the, this is the unique thing about Krishna, that all, so many avatars come, they give some blessing, they do something, they should be a blessing. Ilat, Baraha, Kurma, Matsya, even Ram. But Krishna is teaching about bhakti, Bhagavad Gita. You don't, you won't find like this, comparatively, amongst other avatars. And of course, in the Gita, Krishna says. I, and I have to set a good example, because if I don't set a good example, then what will happen? The world will fall apart if great people don't set the proper example, follow the Veda. But Krishna had no trouble following the Veda. 
Vedic dharma. It is gradually, at least it appears as such. It appears to be a violation of the Vedic dharma. So, how to explain that? Right? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela, he is he, he's, he's making up for the loss in this sense. We talked about the other night in another sense, but in this sense as well. He says in the Gita, I have to set an example I, uh, to teach by example. But his example is <laughs> consorting with apparently, ostensibly, with other people's wives. Pritchett Mara said, you know, this is a fascinating discourse, Guru Maharaj, Sukhumuni, but Krishna is the, is the Dharma Situ, the very bridge of Dharma by which we can walk and cross over the world of what the, the river of Adharma. And he's running with other people's wives. I'd like to get my head around this. Can you help me? And Sukhdev told him what? He said, you should know that Krishna is the husband of the gopis' husbands. He said, Vrajavadu Vajena Vakalpita. What is it? Vrajavadu? Vrajavadu. Idam Chavishnu. Vrajavadu Vajena. Idam Chavishnu. Another verse. He said, Vrajavadu, uh, the, 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 the wives of Braj, He said, when Vishnu, he uses the name Vishnu, he invokes the name Vishnu, when Vishnu is moving, as, as I described, with the wives in Braj, then that's a different thing. You should hear about that from the right source. And what will happen if you hear about Vishnu? acting like this. He uses the name Vishnu just to make it clear. This is Vishnu. Okay. Vishnu is all pervading. Here he is localized in medium size. This is a spe very special dispensation, very special leela. Here is the Purna Brahma. Purna Brahma. And if you hear about him, Bhakti Parampati Lapta Kamam Vidroga Mashubhavino Diyachivena Bhakti will get into your heart and then lust will be chased away. See, Gyan can't even go where lust is. It can't go there. It's not an angle of bhakti. It has no power comparatively. Bhakti can go there. And Hridrogam, the disease of the heart, get the lust. For things, whatnot, whatever, that will be dispensed, and and bhakti will remain and fully express herself. So Krishna, he's a little hard to understand. Brikshit hmm? Maharaj required some some explanation from Rath Brikshit, but he compensates for it in full especially for us in Kali Yuga, in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, because there he, this is his Acharya Leela. Now he thought, I better, I taught about this, but how well is it understood? Did Arjun understand me, what I was talking about? I told him at the end, I love you. That's what, that's what he said. Man mana bhava mad bhakto He says this twice in the Gita, as you know. End of the ninth chapter, end of the eighteenth chapter. The end of the eighteenth chapter, he says it a little differently than he says it in the ninth chapter. He says it in the eighteenth chapter with little concern. Did he understand? I love him. That's what I'm telling you. That's what this whole thing is about. I love you, Arjun. Do you understand it? You love it hard to understand. Can it feel my heart? I hope you, I want you to, to think of me, to love me, because, he said, because I love you. 
That's my message. That's what Krishna told me. Hmm? But it's difficult to understand love. So, in what sense? Coming as a teacher, by example, in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then when he met Arjuna again, in the person of Roy Ramananda, Mahaprabhu said in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Ramananda Roy is kind of Arjuna, and his father is Maharaj Pandu, and his brothers are the Pandavas. Mahaprabhu Swami. Explanation. He met him prior to saying that in South India. He met him because Sarvabhum about the charge said, if you're going to go, you have to go. You're Bhagavan, you are Swatantra, independent, you can go. We don't want you to go, but you are Sanyasi. You Bhagavan, you can go. If you want if you if you do go, do one thing, one piece of advice I give you. There's a fellow I could never figure him out. Sarbon was a very, very learned person. He would give counsel to young sannyasis. He's the most learned uh, logician in all of India for all time. Him and Raghun Shiramani another I think he learned from Sarvabhum also. And he could never understand Ramananda Roy, who was working for the government. He's got of this bubble cup, emotional guy, poetic, spiritual, it would seem, but, but now that he had been converted by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he said, now I, I understand. He would him have something in common. So if you go to South India, you should sure meet him. He is at Godavari. He's been stationed there by Raj, but to go there and meet with him. This meeting is the center of the Chaitanya Church meeting. This meeting, and there's something about this conversation between Ramananda Roy and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, is the Gita, is what the Gita is to the Mahabharata. This conversation is to the Chaitanya Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is the whole the whole thing here, the, the sadhana and sadhya. What is the what is the highest ideal and how to attain it? And in this conversation, everything is reversed. In the Gita, Arjuna is asking the questions and Krishna is giving the answers. In 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 Brahman Samvat, then. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was asking the questions and Arjuna was giving the answers. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was Krishna and he wants to see, did Arjuna understand the full implication of my teaching in the Gita? What I was a little constrained to speak about overtly, given the circumstances, standing on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, dressed as a prince. I'd been here before, And just the thought of that, I'm devastated. I came so close. Gopis came so close to even reuniting with me, but it was not possible. It happened in Kurukshetra, here I am again, speaking about Dharma. The full face of Dharma that is the brain Dharma. And of course, so in this conversation it comes out. Arjun got it. Ramananda Roy, he got it. Right? Mahaprabhu said, you answer my questions, please, and with every answer, you give some, cite some evidence from the scripture, so that your answer will be authoritative. We got to the end. Mahaprabhu said, is there anything more? Can you say something more? He said, I could, but I don't have anything I can, any scripture I can cite. It's just a feeling that I have, and I've written a poem about it. Mahaprabhu encouraged it. Means the Braj is beyond the Sruti, beyond the Sruti. This is what Uddhava realized. When he went there and he realized that Krishna sent me here to understand that which is beyond. I am Shastra Vid. I know that I'm the advisor of Krishna, Dwarka. 
He's God. He's the, you know, as a prince. He asks me what the scripture says. And this is, there's a realm beyond that. That, 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 that in a sense, the scripture has no words for. Of course, we talk about it, we explain the Bhagavad is there and so on and so forth. This is what the Bhagavad is saying. That there's, there, uh, uh, what is what is what they say that Itam Buddha Gunohari, such is the nature of Hari. So, uh, yes, Arjuna wants to do this. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, my point is, but he is Krishna teaching by his own principles. Not just Krishna didn't set the best example in one sense of how to enter into that Leela. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was doing that. And his associates, Krishna's associates who come with him, they serve him appropriately in relation to the mood he's in and the purpose of his, of his, of his appearance. And as much as his purpose is to teach by example, which is certainly an aspect of uh, a dimension of what he's about, hmm? these associates, his closest associates in particular, they set a very good example. Therefore, they are referred to in this way as sadhakas, siddhas, I should say, acting like sadhakas. Once Prabhupada asked me, Krishna Leela here in Portland, that Krishna Leela is Hmm? Was in Finland? Yeah, it was in Finland. Uh, Krishna Leela is very intriguing and exciting, and there's these rendezvous and meetings behind trees and messages with hand signals and so forth. Uh, 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 so much behind the scenes. It seems like very exciting in the forest. But Gore Leela, it seems a little, you know, by comparison, a little, maybe a little boring. <laughs> Something like that. I tell them, no, it's not like that. <laughs> Krishna Lila is, is not complete without the Lord. In Gaur Lila, then, everything that we hear about Bhakti and its power, its potential, you chant once, you do this once, Rupa Goswami is saying, this will happen. We do it a thousand and eight times, it doesn't happen. Hmm? But what Rupa Goswami is saying is, it, it has happened. The potential is there. You should know about it. So keep chanting, and one of the times it will happen. It won't happen otherwise. But it will happen by this, with these different angas of bhakti. And he gives so many examples. Right? There's so many. Follow the Rafa Yatra card, and this will happen. And chant, and this will happen. Seeing the deity once, and so on and so forth. So in Gordi, all the things that like, they all happen every time. <laughs> and so, uh, the, the, they're, they're sadhakas, but they're siddhas, playing a leela of sadhakas. And when they enter into kirtan, then suddenly, relative to where they are, if they go from after breakfast to go on some kirtan to the house of Suklamba, Brahmachari, they come to Godru, Island of Kirtan, Godrum, uh, and there they see so many features. These are features of Nadia. Coward boys herding cows. They're features. <laughs> it's hard to explain. They're features that facilitate the rasas that we can, we can attain. So they see some coward boys and they approach them. The coward boys say to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Why don't you come with us and herd cows? You're not a Brahmin. And suddenly then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the associates with the corresponding sentiment they appear in their Gopavesh. And the whole Vrindavan Leela plays out uh, a new episode every day before them. Hmm? But they've not written beautifully about it in his Navarit um, Bhattaranga. There he's 
riding the waves of, of the Bhavas of Navadvi, going to the different islands and and expressing what kind of experience can be had? What is the experience of Jaya and the Mahaprabhu there? So there's their sadhana siddhas playing the role of sadhakas, but they do their sadhana very nicely. And it works. So the suddenly the suddenly the the the, 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 the world it, it opens, the scene changes, and from Gorli it turns into Krishna. And all the associates in appropriate their in their corresponding forms, they enter into that thing. And then it, and as they come back out and they're gorgeous. And so both the leaders are there, you see. Krishna Lila is fully there and Gorli is fully there. This is the beauty of Gorlila. It might be possible to be in Krishna Lila and not experience Gorlila. You want to be in Nimbarki. You want to follow the poem. You can do that. It's possible. Mahaprabhu at least gave the blessing to Balava. It's possible through Balava you can do that. In Pushti Mahar. In some different kind of Gopi Bhav. And some Vatsavati Bhav. Mahaprabhu gave the blessing. But Balava is an apparent other Mahaprabhu. We can't do it. We can't hear that. They refer to him as such. Both of them are. But, but if you go to Krishna Lila by Gaur Lila, you cannot, you cannot be preoccupied with Gaur Lila and not experience Krishna Lila. That's not possible. That's what it's all about. It's all a Lila of sadhana um, in pursuit of the sadhya of Krishna Lila. Right? So, in Chaitanya Vaishnavism, that we want to experience Krishna fully, not in any other kind of Vaishnavism, not in any other kind of Vaishnavism. It's our sentiment, but that is objective. You won't find this part of Chaitanya, you won't find this aspect of Krishna, who in existential crisis, as I mentioned the other night, is trying to understand what it is that makes Radha the way she is, that she becomes worshipable by him, while all the yogis worship him. He's confused about that. Concerned. I mean, this is not, this, this is this understanding the psychology of Krishna. He's Rasaraj. He sees Radha experiences Rasa that in a, to a measure of extent that I don't. So if I am to be Rasaraj, I have to do something about this. Without Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how can Krishna be Rasaraj? And certainly we can't make Radha Rani Rasaraj. She's Mahabhava. So, so we must, what is the explanation? That is, that is Gaurali or that is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. If you render Krishna Lila through through Navadvi, then you're coming on the highest recommendation there. And then by participating in Krishna Lila, you'll experience Gaur Lila. And by experiencing Gaur Lila, you experience Krishna Lila. And experiencing Gaur Lila is to experience the full measure of Krishna Lila. Otherwise, you don't get the full measure. You've got some episode, some part. I mean, look at Lila and Barkis. They have Saki Bhav, and there's nothing else going on. Only Saki Bhav. Some, some, just that moment in Krishna Lila. Every moment is, is, can completely consume a, a, a devotee. They're consumed by one, one moment, Saki Bhav. There's no, there's no other, in their experience, there's no Vatsalya, there's no, there's no, there's no Gopas. And of course then, they don't experience the full measure of Saki Bhav. The full measure of Saki Bhav cannot be experienced without such Gopas and Gopis. And that is what Ramananda Roy told Mahaprabhu. And when Mahaprabhu said, say something more, and then he gave his poem, what happened? 
he saw what they saw. He saw Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and then he saw Radha and Krishna, and then he saw Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He saw that the union of Radha and Krishna is problematic because the two are trying to become one. And when they become one in a dynamic sense, Radha starts to think she's Krishna and Krishna starts to think he's Radha. And so immediately there's two again. Problem. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the solution. Rasaraj Mahaprabhu Dwee Group. The two in one form. Don't think Gordi has something limited, lesser. And and on a lower level, but so relevant and important to us, it teaches by example. They are all in perfected sadhaka days, right? Practitioner bodies. Now you have a sadhaka day that is not perfected. Your question is Guru gives the sadhaka deha. Means, deha means body, so sadhaka deha. Body means senses, mind. Senses are in touch with sense objects and so forth. And as a result of that, contact and identity arises. So when the senses are in touch with sense objects only for the pleasure of Krishna, another identity arises, right? That gives rise to another identity, a spiritual identity. And that is it. That is what sadhana is about. There's a, there's a goal to sadhana, and that is bhava. Bhava means to be, to, to, from asakti, from attachment, comes an identity. We are, materially speaking, our attachments. And the advertisers know it very well. So, you see the commercials and they've got you figured out. <laughs> You're attached to this, we've been advertised like this. But we are basically our attachments. That's what makes us different from everybody else. That's our identity. I like it hot, you like it cold. That's the difference between you and me. Our likes and dislikes arising as they do in the mind, our attachments. Make an I. You become detached from that I disappears. You become attached to Krishna, that I disappears, and another another identity arises out of that attachment by the influence of the Swarup Shakti. The same thing that will, will happen to the Tatasta Jiva that happens by the influence of the Maya Shakti, in a basic sense. An identity will arise. When we associate with Maya Shakti, then a certain identity arises. It's a changing one. Here we associate with Sarup Shakti because it's, it's, it's Chit also. It's Sat. The identity is going to be enduring. But it comes from that, that environment. That's the very meaning of Tatasta Shakti. It can exist in either environment. It means it will have an identity relative to the environment it lives in. So we, as a jiva, as an atma, we have a potential. We are what might be said to be an entity that has a nature that lends itself to nurture. That's Tatasana. We have a nature and it can be nurtured. Nurturing is the environment. The Maya Shakti will, will nurture it in such a way that it gets malnutrition. Hmm? It's malnutrition. The Sarup Shakti that Bhakti is constituted of provides another environment. Hmm? Is, and that is a very nourishing environment for which you can realize your potential. And that Sarup Shakti comes to us through Sadhusana and different kinds of Sadhusana, different kinds of Bhakti. And so when we get a good sadhusanga, we become influenced by bhakti samskar. When we get diksha, we get a sadhaka deha, the practitioner's body. Your question is, well, what if I got initiated in a previous life, or a previous life, or a previous life? Which one is my sadhaka deha? <laughs> right? Something like that. How does that work? So, it works. In his time, he's explaining. The sadhaka day is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So, if we get Vaishnava diction in a previous life, in the next life, as well as this life, 
then if I've got bhakti samskar and diksha, which is going to give a very strong bhakti samskar, I said the guru who gives diksha is the rupa of Krishna, as Kaviraj Goswami has said, which means in one sense that he gives the mantra which represents the rupa. The form of Krishna is there in Gopal Mantra. In Kandaya 3. These are the main mantras of Chaitanya Sampadaya. So, whereas the Siksha, the Siksha is, is speaking about the nature, so to speak. Um, so, from, from the Guru, actually the Diksha Guru gives the Diksha, gives the mantra, and also gives some Siksha. <laughs> and the Siksha helps us understand the nature of our relationship with Krishna. That is the opportunity for which uh, the developers come before us. So, at any rate, when we get such substantial connection with Gaudi Vaishnavism, Yes, then we get a sadhaka day. But it's a work in progress. And so, Diksha is, in one sense, an, an ongoing affair. When it, it falls into the jurisdiction of Sambandha Gyan, when it's complete, it means that Sambandha Gyan is complete. That means your bhakti now can be fully informed. Not only theoretically informed, but fully informed. So in Bhava Bhakti, there the emotive aspect of bhakti as well as the active aspect of body, of bhakti is in place. And the emotive aspect means I have an emotion. I feel like I'm the friend of Krishna, for example. So your bhakti is now in, informed. Now your bhakti can be very specific. Of course, it doesn't start in bhava bhakti. It would start earlier, but, but in bhava bhakti, the sambandha is, is realized. So as much as the diksha is under sambandha, it may take some time hmm, to perfect the sadhaka day. Hmm. Now you can say, hey, well, it's a different body every time. It's left after life, I got initiated three lifetimes ago. That means in this life you have some bhakti. Bhakti is not inherent in the jiva, but if you got bhakti in one lifetime, next life it will be inherent in you. In the next life it will be inherent in you. Hmm? Bhakti is not part of the of the of the, of the tatasta shakti, it's the sarup shakti. It comes through association. Right? Even materially, same thing, same principle. You have to understand the tatasta shakti, same principle. How material nature works on us, sarup shakti, spiritual nature works on us. Karnamuna sambasya sarasat yoni dhanushu. As you associate, so you become like you get full. <laughs> yeah. so. so, if we have that association in the next life, then when you meet our Guru, you have uh, bhakti is inherent at that point. Hmm? It's the jiva, the, the, the bija. Be to the seed of the rati, that I'm sadhana, that is the sadhya, the role of our sadhana, it comes from sadhana. And guru, the diksha, this is a, of course, a very powerful form, the imparting of diksha is a very powerful form of, of um, you could say, um, sadhana through a very powerful impression, bhakti samskara will come. So, that will carry with you is the point. Now, we hear the Guru is eternal, right? Which one is it? So, <laughs> is it one of the last line? Was it this line? Next line? So in one sense, the Guru is Krishna. So there are many manifestations of the Guru. Hmm? And because they represent Krishna, then we're attracted. Hmm? When I met Sri Ramarsha, I thought, this feels familiar. I've been here before. This feels like it's different, but it feels like what Prabhupada did to me. Two leaves falling at a distant place. 
and you pick them up. Well, oh, they come must come from the same tree. They taste the same. They must have come from the same tree. You put two and two together. Some people say, how can you have two gurus? How is it possible? <laughs> because the guru is one. That's one answer. Hmm? Because the guru is one. Hmm? How can you have a how can you have a father and an uncle? <laughs> That's the way you can answer them. I don't know, how can you have a father and an uncle? How is it possible? And love them both? <laughs> what, what is, how limited is your idea of the capacity to love? What, what possibilities is love? Hmm? In Bhakti, we love everyone. <laughs> and everything. And if we listen carefully and follow, one day we turn around and we see our Guru speaking to us everywhere, to everything. Hmm? What is it? Ayur Harati Vai Tum Samud Yanastan Jayanaso Tasyati Uchinamanityo Uttama Sloka Bhartaya The sun will talk to you when it rises and sets. The world, this verse from Bhagavatam, it's very poetic. The sun is speaking the, the message of the Gita with its rising and its setting. It says, Ayur Harati. Your Ayur, your life, Harati, is being taken away. Ayur Harati by Pumsa means for everyone. People look at the sun, they like the rising setting, they like to watch the sunset, or they don't even notice it. It's such a huge event in our life every day. It didn't happen one day. But make the news. The sun didn't come up. But the Rishis, or someone who's been, had good sangha, good association, and applied themselves in relation to that, who's followed that example, then what the Guru is speaking to us, the whole world will say. It's the same, same idea. Mahabharu saw, saw the cloud and he thought he was Christian. He saw the, the, the ocean, he thought it was the Jumona, he jumped in. He saw the sand dune in Puri, he thought it was the Golden Hill. This is from a praying point of view. There's a tipping point right? with the Udipana. You say, these are the Udipanas for Sakyabha, these are the Udipanas for, for Madhuya Rasa, these are the Udipanas for Matsalva Rasa. Then, in a basic way, when, when rasa is fully developed, then the whole world becomes a deepener. Everywhere Mahaprabhu looked, he was reminded of Krishna. Everything. Taking him over the top. So, this is one answer. Guru is one. Representing Krishna. Of course, the Guru is also a Vaishnav, and he's Kintu Prabhuya Prevatasya. Sakshadaritvena Samastha Shastri. First, we're talking about that. Guru is a representative of Krishna. Guru is one. Kintu, however, Kintu Prabhuya Prevatasya. Guru Ji is dear to Krishna. How can you be Krishna? Sakshadri. And Samastha Shastri, all the Shastra says it. And then how can you be dear to Krishna? How can you be Krishna directly? Sakshadri and dear to Krishna. If you leave it to go to Vaishnavism to be to make your head spin. <laughs> it's very good at that. Kintu Prabhoya. This is a different, a developed idea. Hmm? Because what? Bhagavan and Bhakti, the object of love and the vessel of love, the embodiment of love, they are one and different. Radha and Krishna are one and different. One soul, two bodies. Hmm? This is the Veda Veda. Veda Veda. The object of love is only such if there is love for the object. You can't have an object of love without love. You can't have the love without any objects 
that it corresponds with, right? So, the guru represents Krishna, but he or she is a lover of Krishna. That means Krishna Nandaya. Krishna Nandaya Dimahi Tanya Guru Jodhari. And we will become acquainted with the Ananda of the Guru. The Guru is then a vessel of a certain kind of love for Krishna. Right? Now that means one Guru might be one vessel, let us say, for example, in Madhuri Rasa. We have two Gurus. Who are the Samasi Gurus of our Sampradaya? Yeah, but no. <laughs> no, that's not correct. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Nityananda Prabhu. These are the Samasti Gurus. Then the Gurus coming in the discipline session, they are all Vyasti. Hmm. These are microcosmic Gurus. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Nityananda Prabhu, they are the macrocosmic Gurus. Hmm. They are Krishna, they are Brahm, but they are teaching. Right, it's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Krishna's Acharya Leela. Oh, Balaram is there to help, help teach. He teaches very nicely. You'll hear about it tomorrow. Hmm? Um, but so you have Madhur Rasa, you have Sakya Rasa, hmm? embodied, if you will, in these, in, in these two, they are vessels of this in, in their in their leela of, uh, of sadhus. Hmm. So, one guru may be is the Madhuras, one might be Sakiras, or different kind of Sakiras. Hmm. Right? So now there's some difference. So, what does it mean when they say the guru is eternal? Well, as I said in the beginning, the guru is Krishna, that sense, but in now in another sense we have to answer the question. Because right. I had my guru in my last life, mm. now I have a guru in this life. Well, typically, you know, the, what what type of samskar, bhakti samskar you get by association, if it's actually strong, it does not carry in the next life. So you're going to find a guru of the same sentiment, orientation. Hmm? No problem there. Still, he's a he's a he's still he's a, he's a different he's a different. Gopa or a different Gopi, right? something like that. So now, you know, shall we talk about it from Tattva or should we, or should we deal with everybody's sentiment? Because everybody's thinking, I want my guru to be my one, the one who's my, my sad guru, not the one of the past life or the one of the next life, but the next one, but uh, good enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this question arose to Sri Ramar Shwasa. And uh, you could understand the feeling of the devotees were asking, the Prabhupada's disciples were asking, what happens if you don't perfect yourself, then the next life, then you will get a guru, but what about, you know, what about your guru in this lifetime? So they're, they're thinking about Prabhupada. And he said, the guru will come, the guru is uh, the Krishna, so another represent, representative will come, and so forth. Then he could perceive that. That, that was a tough answer, but they were not very happy with that answer. So, uh, then he said that, um, he said, but if the disciples really want that one guru, then, then they pray, that, then that guru will, in the leader will say to Krishna, uh, Krishna, they're calling me, they want me to come there. And Krishna will say, well, no. Send somebody else who's not been in there yet. You stay here with me. No, they want me. Says, oh, okay, then we we'll send him. But no, they were all very happy. Story. <laughs> but that's a nice story. <laughs> <laughs> but I guarantee you one thing, and I say this in my experience: you'll be very happy. But then it's not good. Hmm? Any real good. Hmm? I am so happy, to, was so happy to be in the company of my Guru Maharaj. Association, the very thought of not having this association was, I spoke a little about the other night, it's very, I had to wait.
and then a group Pantra and so forth. And when I met Julian Marshall, I felt from the same tree. They had different, entirely different, but they loved me. They loved me. You know, I was brought before the GDC in his garden, the story. Um, these were very turbulent days in Iskon, and uh, I had uh, uh, come uh, in contact with the teachings of Pujapatriya Marsh, and I was famous in Iskon for book distribution and being a good, good preacher and so forth. So I contacted the devotees, the godbrothers of mine who had published Sri Guru's Grace that I had come in touch with. and. Uh, and so I could understand this is the Srinivas' solution to all the problems in, in, in ISKCON, in Krishna consciousness. The lack of it is the only problem. There's nothing lacking, probably just to say, other than the only shortage of there is Krishna consciousness. So I could understand this is perfect. Uh, so I got in touch with my God who sort of published the book, and they laughed. They said, Well, if the incarnation of book distribution says our book is going to be because, of course, people were saying it wasn't bona fide and so on and so forth. So we looked up a strategy where I would, because I was well known, I would stay in Islam for some time and then I would canvas and when an opportunity presented itself, I would share the teachings. We thought it was just a matter of a few months and everyone would understand who Shri Marsh was and we would go happily ever after. Of course, it didn't turn out like that. And I was found out. Right by the authorities. I was teaching, speaking to one devotee, and he was very open. And while I was speaking to him and tending to his openness, somebody else opened the door. And I was so absorbed, I didn't notice that devotee. And he heard me speaking about Sridhar Maharaj. So he immediately got on the phone and called one of the leaders. And then they, then they blackballed him from all the temple in about 15 minutes. <laughs> And I was like, whoa, what just happened? Uh, but then one, one devotee, one of the DVC that came to see me, and they said, you know, you, you should be kicked out. Of, you're just going to shoot on Marge because, the, you know, you don't have a fair field here of service. I said, Marge, is, you know, that's true. I don't have a fair field of service, but there's something positive here as well. There's something wrong with this gun, but something positive in shoot on Marge. said, yeah, shoot on Marge is, 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 he must be a nice devotee. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty nice. <laughs> but anyway, he uh, asked me to go you know, to a meeting of you know, the GBC. So I went to a meeting and they, and they interviewed me and they asked me, so what is this now that you are, we understand that you are hearing from Sridhar Marsh? And I said, yeah, that's, that's true. And, and uh, they said, well, why are you hearing like this? So I said to them, I said, that I have a feeling that uh, you all know me, I'm well known, if I was to leave discouraged by the way the mission is being conducted at this time, that, that none of you would come after me. I said, you please forgive me, but that's my feeling. That you would feel relieved to have gotten rid of a, a complainer or something like that. Even all the service I've rendered for so many years to Prabhupada, Prabhupada knew me personally, gave me some yas and so forth. The people were leaving and they were discouraged. I said, my feeling is that if I would leave, none of you would come after me. But my other feeling is that Sri Maharaj, who doesn't know me in a familiar way like you do, hmm? if he was to hear that, uh, that year I was the president of the sannyasis. They had this, I was voted by all the sannyasis to, to, to be the president, to preside over the annual meeting that they had. There were a lot of meetings those days. So I said, my feeling is that if Sridhar Maharaj was told that this, this Swami Tripurari is left discouraged by the organization and the way they're conducting the Prophet's mission and so forth, that he would he would come after me. He would he would send someone out to me. He would shed a tear. That's the feeling they have. And they were silent. I guess I was right. <laughs> they were silent. So I did. I did send them. 
So such feeling, such kindness, such... I went to him uh, one... Uh, I'd bring him for darshan one, one year, and he would always ask the visiting sannyasis or devotees, what was the news? Because it was, those were turbulent times. So he said, what is the news? Marsh, what, 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 what? He knew something had happened, and I could understand that he knew, but he was asking for confirmation from me. But I did not want to tell him, because I knew how tender his heart was, how much he understood what is a jiva, and what does it mean to come in touch with Gaudiya Vaishnavism in this world, what that opportunity is. And if somehow or other, if someone tampers with that and hurts the faith and says, well, what a, what a disaster, that, how, how, how damaging that could be. He really fell for this. Hmm? So I, the news was that, that certain leading members of ISKCON had, who were in important positions had left the mission. And they were, their conduct was not great. So, in Los Angeles, I was outside of Viscon, but you know, we, we, we can't get too far from, from it. <laughs> so, it's everywhere. so I had all the news. And it was big news in Los Angeles, they were celebrating. They were celebrating. But these guys had left, got rid of them. These were leaders. We were the, the leaders would have done that about me, <laughs> the other devotees would have done that about them. So it's really an unfortunate uh, environment. So I said, I gave some other news, some positive news that I knew, that Panchadavita Swami became Janardhan Swami, that he has come in our fold and, 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 and so forth, and uh, he was an Islam guru, he's come under your teachings, he wants to meet you, and so forth. But then Chidamar said to me, is it true that so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so, the three at the same time, that they have, they have left mission their shraddha is, is, is going their faith. They've left the mission. And I mean, I, mean I, I he knew. He had heard it. He wanted the confirmation from me. I said that, I, yes, I, I tried to like, well, you know, that there, there's still, you know, some, and they just began to weep. You can't weep. And he knew them, he had met them, and he knew who they were in relation to Prabhupada and so forth. And then he began to speak about Prabhupada's contribution, how Hindus are proud of him, all Gaudiyas, uh, giving the Vrindavan opportunity through Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching to everybody and so forth. It was very, very powerful, uh, compelling. So I can say this to you like this that if you, if you, if you think my guru is is the best and a sadhguru. If you meet another sadhguru, then you will feel that you can bear your company. That said, still, yes, we will enter into the group of, of one of those gurus, right? Which one? If I got initiated in this life, this life, in this life, Three lifetimes ago, I got initiated by this one. Next life, and he's gone to the Nityadeva. Next life, this one. He's gone to the Nityadeva. Next life, this one. Which, which one will be my guru in, in another sense? Not that, that, that all gurus are uh, manifestations of Krishna, and they're one in that sense, but which one Will I be in his her group? Hmm? You want to know the answer? Whichever one you want, that's the answer. <laughs> so if you think I want this one, then you make that some kind of that that kind of commitment. Then you'll be with that group. Hmm? You understand? So that's up to you. <laughs> so you get a sadhakadeya. Mahaprabhu told Sanatana. The time of Diksha one gets a sadhaka day. It is Purananda, Ananda Moy. He said, he talked about the potential of the sadhaka day. Juva went to, to Vaikuntha in his own body, in his sadhaka day. It's possible. 
Typically in the Gaur Leela we appear there as a young brown boy. This is Dasya Bhakti to Gaur. And then we have Sakya Bhakti or Madhuriya to Chaitanya to Radha and Krishna and Vrindavan. If you want to know your rasa, then you can have a dasarasa, dasarasa to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That's the first answer. Hmm. The answer is simple also. By association, it will be understood. Hmm. But you get a sadhak a day, that means next lifetime, bhakti is inherent in you. You will show up in your body. It's, it's not an entirely material body. How can it be entirely material body? Sadaka day is not a material body. Hmm. So, it, as the sadaka day comes, conforms with the bhakti that has been embedded, if you will, in the jiva and cultivated, then that configuration, the so called material elements, becomes spiritualized. Hmm. But in, 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 in the previous life, we didn't perfect that. In this life you'll come, there will be there will be something about body means also mindset. So mannerisms, inclinations, a wise guru will understand, oh he has that. Hmm. I see. That's coming. Well she has first time coming. Hmm. Again, see tendencies will be there depending on how pronounced or or how how, how you progress. In the previous life. You understand? It's a carryover. Long answer. <laughs> okay. So, no time for more questions tonight. Is the time now? Five to eight. Time for and bowl, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll meet again tomorrow. What time is it at Mongolarki? Seven. 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 We're friendly here. <laughs> 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 Easy.